So welcome. This is our inaugural event of the What's Next discussion. And on behalf of our entire team here at the Chicago Architecture Center, I want to welcome you. And I wish to offer special thanks to our sponsors of today, uh, CAF trustee Sandy Hilton and Norm Edelson. And they believe that this was the direction that the Chicago Architecture Center should take when we opened our new building, that we really need to be looking ahead at what's next. And we're going to be, this is a series, and we'll be having more with accomplished speakers such as we have today, and you can look forward to something in the fall. But you know, when you look at cities, whether it be from Chicago to New York, Paris to Shanghai, all our major cities are wrestling with some of the same issues, how we address the most complex challenges from climate change to inclusive economic development. We'll define which cities lead the way and which ones follow. The good news is that we have very viable solutions around the globe. We look at Copenhagen, who set this ambitious goal to be carbon neutral by 2025. And then Singapore is leading the way with all these wonderful affordable housing initiatives. We know that the world's 600 largest cities will continue to contribute 60% of the global GDP. And with the center of gravity, as we see moving from United States and Europe, shifting to a way to the east and the southeast. That's why when we opened the Chicago Architecture Center, we really wanted to look at the future. And so we asked uh, Phil Langquist, who's on our panel this morning, formerly of SOM, to create an exhibit that talks about from me to we and imagining the city of 2050. Uh, we wanted to celebrate here our rich architectural legacy, but we also wanted to look to what's next and have our visitors and our design professionals really think about what is our shared urban future. You know, in just 31 years, 70% of the world's population are going to live in cities. And 8 billion people are going to populate this planet in four years. And so in many ways, the future is already here. But never before have we possessed the amazing powers to shape our built environment. And yet, so much of what we do is just kind of piecemeal planning. I like to say that if you were a business and looking at 2050, you'd be looking at that future and then planning backwards. Instead, we're using, as I say it, shovel-ready infrastructure and doing incremental change. And if we're really going to save this planet and make a unified urban future, we have to think differently. So this is what we did in our exhibition. And we challenged designers to think about major disruptors in technology, mobility, ecology. And I ask you to look at it on your way out, because it really is a very interesting, challenging exhibit. So today's panel really ratchets up the discussion around the art of getting things done. And they're all doers. So expect to be moved by some big picture thinking as we explore on the ground advancements in urban design, mobility, artificial intelligence, smart cities, urban resilience in all facets, social, economic, and environmental. So with this, I'd like to turn to the panel of experts and ask you to introduce yourselves. Tell us a bit about the work you're doing and maybe share with us why you think you're here this morning. And I'm going to apologize in advance and say that Secretary Paulson has to slip off before the end. So uh, if he's, it's not because anything somebody said in this room, it's just he has another engagement. So I want to thank you in advance. So with that, I'm going to ask Patricia to start the discussion. So thank you. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. You can hear me OK? Yeah, to be here this morning, it's, uh, it's wonderful. So I'm Patricia Holly Purcell. I work for the United Nations Global Compact, which is the private sector arm of the United Nations. Uh, the chair of our board is the Secretary General of the UN, but the rest of our leadership is comprised of businesses. And our goal really is to move the private sector toward uh, sustainable commitments that are then operationalized on the ground. And in, in my particular role, that, uh, that place is in cities. So I work very closely with our uh, corporate uh, partners and our local networks of businesses, of which we have uh, representation in 72 <coughs> countries, uh, along with cities participating in our cities program and other city networks globally, uh, to really identify uh, shared priorities around, uh, really framed around the sustainable development goals and climate change, and how we can deliver shared value for both the companies and the cities on the ground to meet uh, these shared priorities. Secretary Paulson. Okay, I'm, I'm Hank Paulson, and 
I don't have the talent to be an architect. I'm not a, not a planner. But uh, when I uh, stepped down as Treasury Secretary, I decided I wanted to work only in the not-for-profit sector. And, and, and I do a number of things, but you know, like all of us, I wanted to come up with something where I could make a difference and where I had, had, had a real interest. And given the history I had at working with the Chinese leaders, one of the major things I did was set up a institute, the Paulson Institute in China, which I call a think and do tank. We have people, we have about 40 people, half of them here and half of them in China. And again, the focus is on maintaining a stable US-China relationship, but the, the focus really is on en environmental protection and economic markets and economic policies and where, where the two come together. And, uh, and, and so we have a, a, a series of programs that most of which revolve around cities because that's where, you know, China's got, you know, 300 million people going to the cities in the next 20 years. And, and, and so we have a mayor's training program, I think the only one that's focused on environmental protection and sustainability. We have a, a prize, which we give the Paulson Prize for that urban environmental program, sustainability program that makes a difference and has got the potential to be rolled out in scale across China. We worked with a vice premier of China to set up a fund with Chinese money to bring U.S. clean energy, the U.S.-China clean energy fund technologies, you know, just simple technologies that China don't have, DAOs, you know, uh, energy efficient building, uh, Honeywell's metering, those, th th those kinds of things. We, we set up a green finance center and we work with China on, uh, on green financing mechanisms, ways of attracting private capital to, uh, to clean up the environment. And so th that's where I spend. And then, then I spend time also in Latin America with the Latin American Conservation Council and do, do some other things, but most of which are focused on the environment. and and a, a, a lot of them focused on cities. Great, Kerry. Uh, thank you, Lynn. Uh, hi, uh, everyone. Uh, delighted to be here. My name's Kerry Holly. My uh, journey actually began here in Chicago where I grew up, although I, today I live in Silicon Valley. And I, uh, I wrote my first software program because that's what I do, I'm a technologist. But I wrote my first software program at Kenwood Academy at, uh, at the age of 14, uh, some, some several decades ago. Um, and, and from there, I, I went to, uh, you know, was a mathematics major, uh, s wrote my, some professional software at Sears Roebuck, where, where I came out of school, and, and then I, um, I took a detour, went to law school, and then I moved to the Bay Area. And uh, I got involved in even more high tech uh, as an IBM fellow, where I spent the uh, bulk of my career. And uh, a vast amount of things I've done with, uh, in that part of my career, uh, Smarter City Challenges is a big program that, that IBM does. I focused a lot of my attention and my research at IBM on artificial intelligence. Uh, you may remember the iconic display of AI with the Jeopardy uh, win in 2011. So I was uh, happy to be a part of that uh, journey, um, doing some TED Talks on the, the work we did there. I then uh, left IBM just a few years back and, and spent some time at Cisco and I had an opportunity uh, presented to me uh, in the healthcare field where I, I truly believe that smart cities will make healthcare even better. And the work I do now is advancing uh, the largest healthcare company in, in America uh, in artificial intelligence and genomics. And I have a team that, that focuses on these emerging technologies and other things that we see in the future, uh, ambient intelligence, ambient computing, where the world becomes more contextual, becomes more uh, aware of our presence and responds accordingly. Thank you, Lynn, uh, and thank you to CAC for hosting this. And I just, uh, I know many of you in the room, and I think our common ground is really city building. And I look out, I see Jim Lowenberg sitting there, Magellan and Jeannie Gang, who are building this incredible district just a block from here. Or Ann Thompson and Brian Lee, who just did affordable housing over a public library on Taylor Street. Mary Sue Barrett and MPC and your leadership in guiding urban growth. And I, I think this is a room of city builders. So thank you all for being here. And many of you could be here instead of me. Uh, 
I think that cities really have be, become such an important topic to all of us. We understand urban migration, and I think uh, the United States is seeing a reurbanization across the country. I started uh, as an architect, but always worked in city planning from the uh, late 70s, early 80s in San Francisco. <coughs> Uh, when density, uh, mixed-use, transit-oriented development were all bad words. They were all sort of negatives. And we have come 180 degrees to something that is uh, a real embrace of, of urbanism. And we're seeing this not just in the United States, but throughout the world. And it's important as we uh, see global population growth, uh, and migration, whether it's due to climate or political reasons, uh, cities are really critical to our future. So uh, I'm very happy to be here, and I love this subject. Thank you. Well, and thank you for curating our exhibit. Um, so there's a long list of challenges swirling around future cities, with uh, many of them coming down to simply a race against time. So what do you think are some of the biggest issues for cities of the 21st century? And uh, Patricia, because you were so involved with your city initiative, I'm going to start with you again. Yeah, thank you very much, then. I mean, we, we're facing two revolutions right now. One is urbanization, with most of the world's people living in cities and continue to live in cities. And with most of that growth happening uh, in places that have the least uh, resources to cope with, those, with that growth in terms of public services, uh, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of housing, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and also we're facing great threat from climate change. Second is on technology, right? We have an incredible uh, movement of technology. We're talking about AI, we're talking about, you know, drones collecting and delivering our, our, our mail and all sorts of, you know, in our packages and all sorts of other really cool things that can be happening, but also maybe a little bit scary, you know, if you think about displacement of workers and all those other, you know, issues that, that we've talked about. But I think that if, we, if we're strategic about it, we, we need to understand you know, what that relationship is between these, these two you know, things that are happening at the same time, rapid urbanization and you know, advancement of technology. And how technology advances will influence how the future of the city looks like and the livability of that city. And at the same time, as cities grow, how can we harness that agglomeration and the talent and the solutions that are being sort of driven from those people living in cities, you know, that will become our sort of next technological breakthrough that will further, you know, improve livability. But we're not there yet. I mean, we are facing, you know, a huge threat from climate change globally. There's huge levels of inequality in cities. And if we're not focused on how we actually, you know, plan our cities going forward and transfer solutions and utilize technology, then I think there's going, there, there's going to be a, a world where you have even further levels of inequality and sort of, you know, groups living sort of behind walls, if you will, while others, you know, are sort of just left to fend for themselves. And technology and data is very important in this way because how technology is conceived and how data is, is conceived and who's involved in collecting that data, which then will dictate the utility of those technologies and the solutions in an urban space is very important. So we have to be very inclusive from the beginning and how we're thinking about developing new strategies and, and solutions for cities and making sure that they really reflect everyone in, in that city and those future urbanites. Carrie, that sounds like a perfect pass off to you. Yeah, it does. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think that uh, one of our opportunities that lies in front of us is to make cities smarter. Uh, smart cities are going to have a tremendous role to play in helping the disenfranchised. They're going to play a huge role in making citizens more healthy, making them engage with their health. Uh, all of us know that there is a fourth industrial revolution upon us. Uh, we're in the middle of it, or rather the beginning of it, and so sometimes it's not as obvious as the upheaval that is upon us, but uh, you've heard me just sort of casually mention artificial intelligence, but uh, you know, AI is really a general purpose technology. Uh, general purpose technologies are technologies that are ubiquitous. They are embedded in the way you and I live, work, and play. That's integral to a city being smarter. So we're at the early stages of this, and uh, the opportunity uh, for uh, new jobs is, is there. The opportunity to retrain our workforce is there. Yes, we will see some upheaval. 
uh, with this new technology, not just uh, artificial intelligence, but others. Uh, yes, we'll see this upheaval because of the fourth industrial revolution, but cities will have a tremendous opportunity to uh, not only retrain, but to uh, provide opportunities for new jobs, because there will be far more new jobs created than those that are displaced, whether it's uh, uh, citizen scientists, uh, there's jobs in, uh, tremendous amount of jobs in data, tremendous amount of jobs in how do we prevent bias and algorithms, jobs in how we do explainable artificial intelligence. I mean, I could go on and on, but the opportunity to take advantage of this new age is upon us, and cities are gonna play an enormous role in making this up. So Secretary Paulson, I know you're doing a lot of work in China, but I, one of your passions is also climate change. So what are you seeing as some of the biggest issues of cities right now? Well, I, I could basically say ditto to everything that, uh, that Patricia and, and, and Carrie said, because uh, you know we are at a, at a this, this is moving very fast. And you know, as, as Kerry says, we've got we've got the knowledge, we've got we've got the science. The question is, do we have the capacity and and the will to deal with these things? And uh, I'm going to start by building on something that uh, Patricia said. You know, when you when we go from seven and a half to eight to nine to ten billion people, this is going to be in cities largely in coastal areas and in developing countries, and many of which don't have even municipal finance mechanisms. And they don't have the technical, they don't have capacity, financing capacity, they don't have technical knowledge and, and, and capacity. And one of the things, you know, when, when we got started with the Paulson Institute, I set up a CEO council, US-China CEO council on sustainable urbanization. And so we had, you know, Ginny Rometty from IBM with the smart cities and, and Phil was my guru with planning. And one of the things that just hit me from the beginning is if you don't start with the right plan, you end up with a disaster. And it's very, very hard to, un, to, to undo the damage. And we need new models that, it, China is an example, so I'll just use China as, as an example because I think some of the models that are being experimented with, used in China, and effectively can be replicated elsewhere in the world. But so, you know, as, as China puts another 300 million in the cities, that's the size of the U.S. in a couple of decades, their, their old model of urbanization isn't going to work. You just can't keep piling more people into the cities and, and have it work. You know, they, 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 they have had energy intensive, hyper, uh, intensive manufacturing. That isn't going to work. They've very, you know, with, with the dirty air, uh, the dirty water, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the carbon emissions, they, they have, their financing mechanisms stopped working. You know, the way, the way they finance cities was mayors took, you know, a peasant's property, uh, used it to finance uh, to finance growth, which just led to urban sprawl and, uh, and, and created all kinds of uh, financial risks. So they needed new financing mechanisms. They, uh, th they needed green spaces. The cities weren't, weren't livable. And so, but, but I think the biggest thing, my, my biggest takeaway from China is this. And it really comes to financing mechanisms, and and China is a microcosm of, of not it's a macrocosm. There's nothing micro about China, but but it's illustrative of what you see around the world. So to clean up, they they're doing a massive, massive cleanup of their environment, and I, I've never seen anything like it. You know, just really hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, going into re renewable energies, cleaning up the water, uh, cleaning up the air, and but you know th this program costs like three trillion dollars over a, or a ten-year period, and, and they can and they can put maybe ten to fifteen percent the government of the, the money into that. So they went through a process of, of coming up with green financing mechanisms. There's plenty of private capital out there. The government has to set the predicate to, to attract that capital. 
And so what, what they've got, you've got a series of regulations and incentives that have been put in place. They became one of the very largest issuers of green bonds overnight. They came up with the environmental stress tests, which have been very effective. They benchmark green investments right now so that there's, there, 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 there's going to be a, a, a real standard. And so they have a set of, you know, you, it, it takes either subsidies or, or, or regulatory requirements or, you know, they're, they're, they're working to put in place a, a cap and trade system. And one of the things my institute does is, is really work in terms of helping them figure out how to price carbon. And I, here I'm not talking about, uh, about uh, 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 you know, regulatory mechanisms. I'm talking about how to make the financial markets work. <coughs> We're working with them on some pretty innovative things. But one of the things that excites me is not just China as being the biggest emitter of carbon, but these are models that can be rolled out in the developing world because, you know, the idea that the rich countries are going to just funnel money into the poor countries, the rich countries don't have enough money, you know, in, in their minds to deal with, it, with, with their own problems. So again, I, I, I would cite financing as being a huge issue, recognizing though that it's uh, totally, I just couldn't agree more with Kerry that how do we harness technology to make this work? The thing that I disagree with, only one thing he said about, I, I agree all the jobs it's gonna create and all the opportunities, but all the analysis I've done says, yep, it does create all kinds of opportunities over time, and China's gonna be much more competitive. But the losers are different than the winners. It hits different countries, different regions, different industries yeah. differently. So a lot of the money that gets plowed into this comes in early and the payback is later. So it takes a long-term approach. And so what China is looking at, at, at green finance and, as, and energy renewable technologies and so on, they're looking at it as a competitive advantage. So they're, they're, they're looking, you know, well, well, so they're, they're developing technologies that can be rolled out in scale and, and they're looking to be the world leader. And, you know, they're doing some things that aren't nice. I mean, they've got tariffs on environmental goods and products coming from the United States. You know, there, there shouldn't be any, the idea that there's inv tariffs on any environmental goods or services around the world is just ludicrous, okay? But we've, so in any event, that's, I'm sorry to go on so long. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to come back to you, so don't worry. So Phil, you know, you're building cities around the world. What do you see some of the, as some of the big issues? Uh, you know, it's, it's a big and complex topic, right, cities. Uh, so you can approach this in lots of different ways. I, I think there are three things that come to mind to me uh, that are at the top of the list. Uh, and all three, I think, have sort of positive trends. But the first is that no matter what city you go to, no matter what urbanizing region you go to in the world, you see breaks, significant breaks in the ecological chain. You, the way we build our cities or create our energy or move our people, we fragment our ecology and erode our ecology. And I think this is, the first one that comes to mind. And I do think that, that technology is helping us measure, quantify the benefits of healthy environments and how that contributes to uh, economic and physical health of cities. So you see things like the U.S. Forest Service being able to measure tree canopy shade in Austin and translate that to energy savings in the summer and the health of neighborhoods uh, that have tree canopies versus neighborhoods that don't. And this kind of simple example, I think, just points to how we can start to quantify the benefits of a healthy environment. Uh, the second trend is that we've got to uh, eliminate coal from our lives and we've got to get out of fossil fuels and we're seeing remarkable trends in renewable energy both uh, solar and wind. Uh, in our, I just, I had a tour of Iceland where they're completely on geothermal. Uh, 
But uh, wind and solar particularly are decreasing in cost and increasing in efficiencies. Uh, and if you look at what the National Renewable Energy Lab is doing related to wind energy, it's really remarkable. So freeing ourselves of coal is just essential. And that also positively impacts the way we use fresh water. And then the third is that uh, if we're relying on cities uh, to accommodate this global growth, we've done a really good job of making them expensive places to live in. And we have to find a way to make cities, uh, as Edwin says, inexpensive, not affordable, because that brings all sorts of baggage with it, but inexpensive, quality places to live that are accessible to all. And I, I think we have really struggled with making cities be affordable. Ooh, I use that word. Uh, inexpensive. Uh, so I think those three trends, though, are very uh, important topics right now, uh, investing in our environment, shifting away from fossil fuels dramatically, and, and making cities uh, just for everyone. I think those three things are what I would focus on right now. You know, Harry, last night, uh, we were fortunate we had dinner together and got to know each other a bit better um, and asked some questions, but one of the questions we were talking about is, you know, smart data, who owns it? Yes. And how do you really build a comprehensive infrastructure for smart cities if you're not owning all the data? So do you want to just kind of talk about some of that discussion? Yeah, I think the, uh, when you talk about smart cities, and I echo everything our, uh, the panelists here have said, when you think about smart cities and if you think about tech companies, tech companies clearly are doing massive data collection. But cities really need to be in the business of data collection as well. And they, cities have vast amount of data. Just think about some of the facts that we know. We know uh, that we can detect uh, uh, the onset of Alzheimer's through voice. How much voice data are cities collecting? Well, they, they certainly have it because people are calling up for city services probably over decades. Uh, that's an enormous amount of data that can be used to help citizens be more healthy. Uh, we know that we can use data to uh, determine that there's pollutants in the air. Uh, we know that we can use data for public safety. Uh, we know that the data collection is, uh, can be done through sensors that are in a variety of places, whether they're in uh, traffic lights, whether they're in parking meters, whether they're in homes. Uh, we also know from a health standpoint, when you think about the totality of data, we know that clinical data is actually the least determinant in terms of health outcomes. We know that we add on genomics data, which is arriving in there and, and here now. That adds another 30 percent, so we're about at 40 percent now. But if we look at behavioral data, what uh, many call exogenous data, that's when we really get the full picture and are able to actually make citizens take a more active role in engaging. Uh, it's also an opportunity, not just from a health perspective, from a safety perspective. I mean, we have the technology today to detect that a gunshot was fired. Uh, 500 meters and be able to deploy uh, resources to help citizens who might be in trouble. Uh, we have technology to, uh, to improve and, and predict accidents. Uh, we have technology to maximize uh, traffic patterns. The technology is there today. The opportunity is for citizens or for, for cities to, to leverage it. But back to the main question, I think that cities have not focused on data and the fact that they have this tremendous uh, resource of data, what we call big data, uh, that can be used in a variety of ways. That's going to require investment in hardware uh, to actually do something with the data. It's going to be an investment in people to do the right analytics, to use artificial intelligence, to actually solve some of the most wicked problems that cities have. But I think cities like tech companies need to be in the business of owning data and collecting data, uh, not for nefarious <coughs> purposes, but for these positive outcomes of health, safety, uh, and so forth. And Secretary Paulson, when we were in the other room, we were talking a bit about this. You were talking about, you know, kind of China's advantage in this way. Talking about what? Talking a bit about China's advantage with uh, data. Yeah, well, they, uh, they, they, they certainly, one, one of the things, I, I think we innovate uh, in America like no country in the world. When you look at the combination of our 
uh, of our, our top universities, when you look at uh, Silicon Valley and our venture capital and all of our you know, infrastructure around <coughs> in, investing, the intellectual property protection, the, the, uh, uh, the, the markets we have, the capital we attract here. Uh, but no country does a better job than China in commercializing something very quickly, rolling it out very quickly. And th th there's no doubt that when you look at, uh, at uh, uh, you know, that you, know, you, you talk about the positives of these, uh, of these uh, technologies and, you know, for every positive, you know, it's, you know th this data can be used for, for a variety of purposes. And, uh, you know, the, the Chinese have got great, great facial recognition technology. It, 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 it's amazing, you know, what, what, what they can do right now. And, uh, and you know, it, it can be used, you know, some people think very positively, like, you know, for instance, take, uh, take a gaming. You know, everybody's got a, a different view, but, uh, you know, the, 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 the Chinese view is young people shouldn't waste too much time on gaming, right? And, and so they've got a, a rule that if you're under 16, you can, you know, you can be gaming, you know, uh, for one hour a, 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 a week. And they don't just trust, you know, passwords. You could use your father's or your big brother's password. So they got facial recognition. And it's very, very, very sophisticated facial recognition. And that's the same facial recognition that can look at people, you know, with one in a million reliability. So they can look and see who people going into Starbucks and they can look and say, well, if there's, you know, if there's five or, you know, they, they start tracking people and they start saying, well, are, are these five and six people meeting here and then they're meeting there and whatever. So it, it can be used, it, it can be used in a variety of ways. But, you know, the, we, we were talking beforehand about, uh, about 5G and, and how 5G is, you know, going to revolutionize, it's, it's, it's not just like going from 3G to 4G. When you look at the low levels of latency and the huge speed levels, that this will be another industrial revolution. When you look at everything from, you know, micro manufacturing to, uh, to, 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 you know, a lot of us just think about it in terms of entertainment and so on, and, but it, it, it's going to, going to make a huge difference in, in the world. And, you know, we have, I, I think we're innovating better than anyone, but when you look at the investments that they marshal, and it doesn't take China two years to site a cell tower, right? They just build them. And it doesn't take them two years to auction off Spectrum. And, uh, you know, they can subsidize Huawei. And uh, as, as they're working to set global standards. So there, there's, a, there, there's, but, this is about cities, and there, there's no doubt that, that, that China is going to have uh, smart cities. And I, I've been, you know, amazed. You know, when you look at just simple things like, uh, like, like payment systems, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, in, in, in Beijing, you don't need to carry a wallet or a credit card. You just use your phone. If you want a bike rental, you just, you know, tap your phone. If you want to get noodles on the street, you, you, you touch your phone. And some of the, you know, when I look at some of the uh, investments that this fund we've helped set up around smart cities and energy efficiency has done, there are cities in China where when it just comes to parking, you, you, you look at your phone and it tells you where the parking spots are. And uh, and it's it's really very very efficient. So there's a lot that can be done, and I would take away the positive model, which is th th these technologies are remarkable. But it takes the capacity, uh, and it takes planning, and it takes uh, and it really does take marshalling a lot of capital. So Patricia, when you look around the globe, I mean, answer this: What are you seeing? Yeah, no, I mean, I just there's. So I work a lot with fintech companies, financial tech companies, so there's like the credit card industry and what uh, Secretary Paulson was just describing what's happening in China. I mean, it's completely leapfrogging. You know, the whole idea of a credit card, it seems like completely archaic. There's, uh, you know, there's all of these sort of ways of having uh, both your payments, your, your banking, your uh, parking, your uh, 
communication, all in sort of one you know, card or device, things on your mobile phone. So it's a complete change, a step change, you know, in how we're thinking about things. Well, let me mention one thing, which is an up. This, let's have some good news. So the, we look at look at fintech. So Ant, which is the yeah. Alibaba's, you know, financial institutions, uh, uh, on online finance uh, financing mechanisms. So Jack Ma said, I, I'd like to come up with something that. That taps into young people's interest or people's interest in protecting the environment. So he came up with Ant Forest, which was a, a, a an affinity group on climate. So it, it, you could tap onto this, and it's your own little climate calculator. So you could you could determine, you know, what, what your carbon emissions were, and as you achieve certain results, you know, you, you plant a tree, right? And, and so he wanted to start this and say, well, I'd like to start it if we had 10 or 15 people. You know, well, the first month he had 30 million people. He's now got 300 million people with Ant Financial in Ant Forest. So people care greatly now. So you can now take that and you could use it in all kinds of ways in, in, in terms of, uh, of, uh, uh, of identifying green uh, green companies, you know. So Alibaba has got all kinds of you know small businesses. You can identify green companies. You could do things around packaging. So that's th th that's just one. You mentioned fintech, and yeah, that's exa just huge. No, exactly right. And and well, in India, I'll give you an example of where this type of innovation uh, can. Is, we are exploring this now with the city we're working with in Chennai and some fintech companies. Is how you leapfrog. Forget about the sort of the technologies you know that we think we have uh, here in America. But there, it's about uh, developing a whole new transit system um, within the city to help co con congestion, obviously address things like air pollution, climate, but it's also about connectivity, and it's also about inclusion. But interestingly enough, it's also about identity, right? So there are many, and that's a huge problem in, in India, right? Which is, of course, now going through the largest exercise of democracy in, uh, in history with its uh, billions of people you know, vote, voting. Um, so identity is a big issue. So how do you actually identify people, give them access to goods and services, um, give them access to transport? So this is really integrated sort of systems thinking. Um, but it's happening you know, and, and being tested in, in places like in Chennai or, in, or in, in China, as Secretary Paulson was saying. So I think we need to really keep our eye out of what's happening. And you know, I like what Chicago you know, is, is doing in terms of the center here. I think about how that can embrace sort of the global solutions that are being developed and tested elsewhere and where the sort of exchange of knowledge sharing um, and innovation and how that can be, can be harnessed. Yeah. Phil, because you've been building in the world, I mean, what are you seeing examples that we can look at, that we can grab, how will we transform the society here? Hmm. Uh, well, there are lots of good examples. Uh, Patricia brought up uh, Curitiba last night. We talked a little bit about that. And, I think they were one of the first really innovative thinkers in terms of uh, inexpensive uh, and flexible infrastructure that could be implemented easily like their bus transit system. And they also tied rapid bus transit into uh, a Volvo building company, building the buses in Curitiba, so they created jobs as well as an effective bus system and they got people out of their cars. And, uh, I think cities that can find ways to implement quickly uh, uh, in, in, in innovative ways, rethinking sort of the traditional public infrastructure and public space, I think that's where you see real innovation. Uh, even these simple events like taking over streets. Uh, I was just in Knoxville where they, they have this weekend where they take over uh, all the parking spots on public streets and it becomes public space and people landscape it and in two days it's completely transformed into a much more human city and you realize how much of the public realm we've just given over to the car. And I think the next generation, especially with technology and Ubers and less parking and maybe uh, more things in movement, we can get some of that land back that we've lost to the automobile and, and make cities much more human and interesting, green and soft. And Carrie, I mean, because you've looked, you know, whether it be your IBM experience, you've looked at what's going on around the world, uh, but also with your healthcare experience now, what are some lessons that we can be learning from your world? 
That's a great question. I think there's uh, lots of lessons. Uh, one is that, uh, and I talked about data already, but um, you know, one of the things I'm teaching the company I'm at right now is the importance of saving data, uh, because uh, we see patterns that uh, that we that we really need the, uh, the historical data to see these patterns, whether it's patterns to help us uh, um, move people more efficiently, whether it's patterns to, uh, to help uh, cars move more safely. Uh, so data collection, I would say, is, uh, is, uh, is, is prime and uh, essential. I also think the, uh, uh, you know, just, just keeping our, uh, our antennas up in terms of what's next, uh, there's a lot of technology on the shelf that cities can take advantage of. And I think that, uh, I would say data and just you know, keeping an eye out for some of these advancements and how to apply them in the cities. Cities need to do more, I think, with apps, do more with mobile. Uh, you know, what uh, Secretary Paulson said in terms of what Jack Ma is doing. Uh, there's just tremendous opportunities to exploit these, these activities in cities. Well, we talked a, a bit last night and again today about the inequality of cities. And how do you get, how do you create a just city? I mean, what are, I, I'm going to turn to Patricia on this one, you know, with uh, some of the UN, I mean, with your 17 sustainable development goals, you talk about this, and you might want to talk about some of the goals and then talk about, you know, the just city too. Sure, I mean, well, I'm very interested in this. This is the first time actually I've heard this um, uh, objection to the word of affordability and, you know, and, and moving toward, uh, instead of using the word inexpensive, because I, I think you're absolutely right. Affordability um, implies quite a bit, um, but it's a, it's a term that is widely used and promoted within, within the United Nations, uh, because it is about access, and it is about inclusion, and it, is, it does imply uh, standards of labor and decent work and uh, affordable housing and um, and, 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 and many other things. And as Secretary Paulson will, will well know, when the United Nations was uh, negotiating these global deals that produced the sustainable development goals, uh, one of the big, and there were many, uh, bits of, uh, of, of points of discussion you know, and negotiation, and one of them uh, was around this uh, term of affordability, and particularly as a, and, and around housing as cities grow, uh, looking at Sustainable Development Goal number 11, which is all about sustainable cities. And there was a big debate. Uh, many countries in the developing world that are rapidly urbanizing wanted to see this language of affordability and, and access as a right, as a human right. Um, that was countered by countries like the United States, which said, we, we say that, if we enshrine that, you know, this is a very litigious society, we could wind up having people sue us because they can't access affordable housing, you know. So these are some of the big sort of ideas and debates that, that were happening around that time. And, and so I think we need to, when we look at, you know, this huge, um, seemingly intractable issue of inequality and growing inequality in cities, we need to bear in mind that, you know, it, Yes, we have this global framework for the Sustainable Development Goals, but how, and, which is wonderful, but how that is actually executed and, and, and its meaning entirely comes down to how cities themselves and the countries and the governance in, at a national level, at a state level, and at a local government level actually embrace those. The policies and the regulations and the enabling environment that they create and how they make their cities equitable through those policies and regulations, that has to be the way that the Sustainable Development Goals are achieved, because they cannot be achieved at this sort of you know, global level. I mean, even for cities themselves, local governments themselves, I work very closely with a lot of local networks of local governments, and global networks of global governments, and local governments, and they will tell you that when the Sustainable Development Goals were, were developed, and when the Paris Agreement was developed, it wasn't in mind that this was for something for, for cities. It, even the city's own sustainable development goal number 11, it wasn't meant for cities. So this is some, so it, my point yeah. is that it has to be, now that's completely changed. We're seeing a huge amount of action and mobilization, and in America, cities are great examples on climate, where there's a great amount of leadership and dedication you know, to achieving these sort of global agendas, and cities can start to see themselves in these global agendas. Uh, but in but it, when we think about inequalities, I mean, again, it has to be through these policies and enabling environment that are actually 
acted at the, at the local level. But I think what yeah. we're missing, if, <laughs> sorry. No, you can go next, and then okay. Secretary Paulson. Uh, when we talk about things like affordable housing, it really isn't a big enough idea. We, we have to talk about accessible communities. We need vibrancy and community grouped with affordable housing. And if we could redefine that as affordable communities that have access to transit and have access to jobs and have access to schools and food, then we're talking about something. Yeah. But, but building affordable housing, we have a lot of examples of where that's built in isolation yeah. and that's not really doing anybody any good. And I, I think that uh, in cities like Chicago where you've got so much inner city vacant land, you have the ability to reinvest in building communities, vibrancy, and affordability, but it's gotta be bigger, a bigger idea than just housing. Yeah. Secretary Possum. Yeah, I, first of all, I really agree with what Patricia and Phil have just said. One other thing I do is Erskine Bowles and I chair in economic strategy group, an Aspen economic strategy group, where we put together 60 very prominent people, policy makers, very, very senior policy makers, you know, bipartisan people like Rubin and Geithner and Summers and Podesta and the Democrats and, you know, Bernanke and Mankiw and Hubbard and, 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 and CEOs and young economists and labor leaders and so on. And, and this is for the U.S. And we concluded our economic policies aren't working today. They really aren't. Our economy is humming, but you know, uh, over half of Americans are being left behind, and in, 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 in very meaningful ways. When you look at the level of income disparity, and you know that 40 percent of Americans have $400 or less in savings. I mean, this isn't our, our, our democracy is not going to work, and this is not just cities. Let me tell you, the biggest problem in, in America is rural, because there's a, there, there's a, there's a movement to, to cities, and so it's a, a, a flight to, to, to cities of, of, of the most uh, able and, and innovative and well-educated people. But when we looked at it, we looked at there's no magic bullets, but there's a whole lot of things that can be done. We, we looked at said massive investment in community colleges, you know, with a goal to take, you know, those Americans with either a college degrees or a high quality uh, uh, labor certi work certificate, you know, from 40 to 65 percent, and 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 things that r really could be done, or or a payroll subsidies to for for companies to to defray the cost of raising minimum minimum wages. Or when you talk about, I agree with Phil, it's not, you can't just build, you know, affordable housing. But when we looked at affordable housing, the economists on both sides basically said you could have sensible zoning reform and do it on a systemic basis and really get things done. So there's, the ideas are out there. And you see, what Patricia said is absolutely right. It takes, it, it takes a political will. You know, the UN can set all these, you know, sustainability targets, and they're, you know, they're nice because there's something for people to talk about and look at, but it's how they're implemented. And uh, in the US, we have a, a, a dysfunctional political system right now and in Washington, and more is being done at, at, at the local level and at city levels. But I think so much of this is gonna come down to what governments are able to do. The political will and in, in which, whether, whether the Western democracies are gonna be able to do the things they need to do, whether, whether China's gonna be able to do the things they need to do, but it's, it's gonna be political will. And the, the thing that I know for sure it, a lot of things you don't know for sure, but unless countries can solve this huge income disparity problem, uh, political systems aren't going to work. They're not going to work if they're authoritarians here. Uh, you know, uh, 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 authoritarianism systems like China. They're not going to work if they're democracies. You know, people more people have to succeed, and it's not going to be easy. 
you know, Kerry may be right in terms of all the opportunities that are created. And I believe technologies are going to create opportunities. I really do. But almost every new technology I see being developed eliminates a whole lot of jobs that can be replicated. And those people, and that's maybe creative destruction, but those people aren't going to be looking at it and say, well, this is good for the economy longer term. And so how we deal with this income disparity is going to be key. Like yeah, I was going to say, Kerry, like yeah. To, to add, you know, I grew up in Chicago. I grew up in the, uh, the inner city of Chicago. And at least from what I understand, the educational system in the inner city here in Chicago really hasn't improved in 40 years substantially. It's still uh, leaving uh, quite a number of kids behind. And my experience has taught me that uh, most of those kids that are left behind, it actually starts at about seven, uh, seven years, eight years of age. It doesn't start in high school and in college. It starts at a very young age. Uh, and if you look at the challenges, I know the challenges I faced growing up uh, on the south side, uh, there were challenges of safety. There were challenges of poor education. I had the luxury, I mean, I had, a, to be blunt, I had a very poor education uh, in, the, uh, in the Chicago public school system. My education was augmented uh, by uh, Secretary uh, Arnie Duncan's mother, who took me in and uh, ran a children's center. Um, uh, that ch children's center still operates, but that center was really my salvation in terms of education. But if you think about uh, things like Khan Academy, uh, there's a, there's, I think there's an opportunity, and technology is not a savior here, it's an enabler, but I do think there's an opportunity uh, when we talk about affordable, accessible housing, we also have to have safe uh, neighborhoods, and we have to have school systems that work. And one way, uh, not the uh, silver bullet, but one way is to use technology more rapidly to infuse opportunities for kids in their own homes to augment what's not happening in the, uh, or may, may be happening, but to augment the uh, school system and, and to use the uh, cities to make neighborhoods uh, you know, all across the city of Chicago safe so that uh, uh, kids can uh, roam the streets. They can, maybe not roam the streets, but they can, you know, <laughs> they can live healthy lives. You know, one of the things that you talked about, which I found really intriguing, because I think all of us kind of feel like we're living in the I don't know era, like what's coming up next? It's coming, the technology's changing so fast. How do you predict? How do you train? And so I asked you, like, how, how do you know what's coming up 10 years? And I thought it was interesting for this audience just to hear, like, how yeah. are you um, predicting the future? Yeah, what I mentioned at dinner is that uh, it seems, you know, difficult to predict the future, and, and it is difficult to be precise. Uh, but at the same time, if you look at Leonardo da Vinci and how he predicted the future, and he was remarkably accurate if we go back and look at his uh, predictions. Well, he lived in a time where the population was, was much smaller, but he also lived at a, uh, and, and was, had the opportunity to have all the great thinkers in the world uh, visit him uh, because of travel uh, uh, situations at that time. They stayed for months. Uh, but he engaged with scholars, uh, people we don't know historically any longer, but we have the same thing that we do today. So how do uh, uh, top technologists uh, understand the future? We, we engage with academia. We engage with top professors, students. Uh, we engage with uh, our peers in, in the industry. Uh, we engage where the uh, problems are. But um, you know, most of the technology that we talk about today has been in play long before it became ubiquitous. So if you look at the iPhone or smartphones, if we look at you know, all the things that we think as innovations, which they are, we knew about those technologies a good 10 to 15 years before we started making useful tools to exploit those technologies. So my point is that um, we can see the future. I think that um, um, today uh, a lot of us believe that ambient computing uh, is the way to go, uh, is, is where the future lies. And what ambient computing is, is that we begin to live in a world that actually becomes aware of our presence uh, because of the intelligence of things, uh, because of 5G enabling the rapid uh, uh, movement of data across uh, 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 swaths of, of land. But the, uh, the ability to uh, have ambient computing, which is fused by uh, intelligence and artificial intelligence, I think, as a, is, is where the hockey puck is going in terms of, um, of where cities will, will actually shine and become smarter. You know, we were talking about, uh, Patricia, you know, the fact that we can actually learn a lot from the developing nations because they're leapfrogging. Do you want yeah. to just discuss that a bit more?
the typical approach of the United Nations has been developed country to developing country, both in terms of resources and in terms of technologies and solutions. And as Secretary Paulson rightly said, we need to completely shift, and it is shifting, uh, that mindset, because this is no longer about aid, and anyway, there's insufficient aid to uh, address the growth and, and the needs of, uh, of, of the population uh, in developing countries. And so we also then, at the same time, need to change our perspective on this sort of importing, or what I say is helicopter development, you know, from uh, the uh, developed world coming in, landing in a landing in the developed country or developed city, and saying, "Oh, here's the uh, here's the here's the solutions to your water and sanitation issues. You know, here's the solution to your transport issues." And I think what we when we think about the future. Um, and I, and I see this already happening now, there is a real trend and recognition of the value of tapping into and incubating and deploying local level solutions to local challenges that actually address global problems like climate change. And I see this more and more happening in places like Nairobi, my former home, uh, in places like Chennai, um, and in and other cities where there's innovation by necessity and there's leapfrog because there are they are starting from a completely different base. So there's there's an opportunity for this collective innovation to be harnessed and and to be, uh, I guess sort of brought to market in a way that we hadn't thought about previously. So one of the things that we're trying to do within the UN Global Compact and our network of businesses, they say, I say first question I ask is, where are your market interests? You know, what are, the, what are you talking about in the boardrooms? Where are the, you know, the places that you're looking to work? And, and this is, makes the conversation very interesting because obviously companies need to have a return on their investment. And what they're interested in is finding the new next thing. So they're really excited. If you can create that enabling environment for them to enter an emerging market, and, and you create a good labor market within that local market, that becomes a really interesting conversation. It's not just about incremental change, then it's about transformative change. And global companies are saying, that's great. You don't just have a plan for a project in a city, you actually have a program to shift completely to electric mobility, for example, you know, that can actually then be very valuable to, to the market. And that's how things change. That's how you move away from you know, fossil fuel, and that's how you move away from sort of this car society, is getting that sort of shift. But it comes from making the, the local markets interesting to, to global players. So I think that building a little bit on what Terry was saying, what we can envisage, and I think you know, maybe some of the philosophy, but philosophy behind what the center is trying to do, is a much more and deeper and structured exchange between different groups. It has to involve private sector, it has to involve <coughs> academia, but it also has to involve the arts and others that are really, you know, that affect everyone in a, in a space and, and affect how we, how we live. Well, that actually shifts really well to discussion of, you know, the common good. Like, what institutions are going to take us forward? Is it government? Is it other institutions that, you know, we might have to create new ones? So, thoughts on that? I just want to say oh, yeah. one thing because what Patricia said was very profound about innovation by necessity. And so, you know, we, we see it all over the world. And she gave the examples, I won't repeat them. But the other thing that makes it easier is in countries that are developed and advanced, it's the reason it's harder. Not only do you already have the old technology, but you've got vested interests that are hurt when they're changed. And vested interests are very, very difficult to deal with, and uh, and they screw up the political process. So th th that, to me, is is, and that is where I think the developing world really can uh, lead the way. And you're asking which institutions? You know, I, you know, I, uh, you. These aren't. When you're looking at things, all the things that Phil talks about, right? You know, so all the planning, transportation, uh, solid waste uh, d d disposal, uh, building. You know, because 60 percent of carbon emissions come from buildings, and and so energy efficiency with buildings. All that's done locally, right? That's that, that's at the city level. So there, the subnational is important. And I'm, I'm going to be something of a naysayer here because, you know, people talk all the time about 
you know, everything that the business can do, innovating and business is going to lead the way. And they, you know, so you talk about, and, and sure, business and academia plays a huge role and NGOs play a role and, and they all need to work together. But my own strong belief, after having worked all around the world, is that our enemy everywhere are flawed government policies at the national level. I mean, just look at our policies in the U.S. We, we put tariffs on solar panels, we export, you know, coal, you know, we encourage that. We, 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 we don't, we don't ta tax carbon emissions, pollution <coughs> emissions, but we incentivize, you know, we, we give tax incentives to find carbon-based fuels. And there's, you know, even if you weren't worried about climate change, that's crazy because we, we have no shortage of these. You know, why, why are we spending that money? So, I, I, on almost everything, it's flawed government policies, and we are not going to come close to meeting the, the, the Paris targets or, you know, unless we have, you know, strong advocacy at the national government level and get the right policies in place. So I, it always is great to stand up and feel good and talk about all the things that business is doing and all the things that business is doing. And every bit helps and everything that NGOs are doing. But I look at it and say, if that happens, we're gonna win a lot of wars and we're gonna lose the battle. So, yeah. so as I look at these institutions and the importance of the institutions, I look at institutions and say, what institutions can help move government, can help get policy change. And here, I don't, you know, I'm a, I, I, I love business. I, everywhere I work, it's, we work with, with, with business. I, it's one of the things I do, work with business on an NGO, you know, as an NGO and work with them on philanthropic things. But one thing I've learned is you can't count on business to, to, to lobby. Because when they go in to see government, they've got a fiduciary duty. And I remember talking with a, you know, this is one example, a senator from Georgia, you know, and, 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 and he said, Hank, I haven't had one CEO ever come in to me and talk about climate change. And ask anybody else here. And I said, well, you know, surely, I, I named the guy from Coca-Cola who I was working with who was really big on climate change. He looked at me with a smile and said, he doesn't talk about climate change, he talks about the sugar tax. And so, <laughs> and so, so, so I, think we, I, I think we need to be realistic. So there, I, so to me, the work that NGOs do, that academia does, that others do to help, you know, uh, put pressure on government and advocate, I think is, is really important. So for me, that's where my emphasis is, getting things done at the city level that really make a difference, you know, where it's non-political and where the great things are being done at the city. And then I'm all for academic, you know, University of Chicago's got their city labs. I mean, there's all sorts of good work that's being done that can be brought to bear to try to change government policy. So that's my two cents worth. If I, if I could just kind of raise a different Question, the United Nations, I think, just came out last week with that report on a million species at risk yeah, of extinction. Yeah. Uh, and so there are some challenges that are requiring us to innovate yeah. and think bigger than at the scale of a city or the scale of a region or the scale of a nation. I mean, when we're facing a challenge like this, an urgent challenge like this, how do countries come together uh, and I, I love this, I, this example you used, Hank, of Jack Ma and the, the, the system where you can track your carbon footprint. But, you know, could everybody also track their, their impact to wildlife or get it into your daily thinking of how you're improving the life of the bumblebee? Or, you know, how do you shift this priority. There is, you know, there's a lot of people, environmentalists all around the world are looking to China in uh, 2020 when they host the, the CBD COP15, which is again the, the focus on biodiversity. And if you care, and, and to me, you know, Phil, you've come back to biodiversity a number of times, and I, re I really believe this is you know, huge. I mean, 
you know, it, it, it's, you know, that, that when you look at our planet's ecosystem and the rate at which, which species are being extinguished or just, I, I remember when I was a kid going and driving on a car trip and all the dead insects we saw on the, on the, on the edge you don't see, you, know, you just look at what's happening to insects around the world, it's, it, it's incredible. But I, I, I don't, frankly, I wish I saw, so I think China chairing this is important. It would be great if they picked it up like they picked up their you know, green finance. I don't see them doing that right now. I don't see the same, you know, m my institute is working on this, but I don't see the, the same commitment. And, uh, and uh, they're not gonna even hold a conference in Beijing, you know, and, and so it, it's, but I, I really do think it, it's going to take, uh, you know, there are financing models. There, there, there are compliance models. There are targets that need to be set in, in this area. But it, it's, a, it, it's a real challenge. But I think we don't know, we simply don't know our level of impact uh, that should, it sounds like it's going to be measurable soon. But uh, we don't know personally our own daily impact, whether it's positive or negative. Well, we, we don't know that. But one thing we do know, which no one talks about that much, the, the huge issue is population, right? You know, are there enough resources? You know, you know I question, I, I, had a, I had a very senior leader from China say to me once when the U.S. was criticizing him on carbon emissions and so on. And he was, he was in Washington, D.C., and it was a hot day. And he said, well, it's 95 degrees. I was so cold in my hotel room, I needed to, to wear a heavy blanket, have a heavy blanket. Then we went to exercise, and people are exercising, and it's air-conditioned. Then they take a hot shower. Then they get in an air-conditioned car. And he said, you're lecturing us. He said, there aren't enough resources in the world for, you know, for one and a half billion Chinese to live like you live in America. You've given us a bad economic model. And I, I really do think the, the, the basic question, you know, which is, uh, I, I don't have the answer to it, but it is going to take different economic models when we have, you know, when, when you look at a world with, with, with nine and 10 billion people, how can, how can we sustain that number of people and protect our, our ecosystem? Yeah. And it, it's a, that's a very negative thought to leave you with, so that we got to go to Kerry. <laughs> because, because, because oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, we don't have a lot of time here, guys. I mean, the climate change is real, um, so not even just time on the panel. we got to start moving. I think we've all sat in these panels and just, we, it's gloom and doom, but we got to have solutions. So, Kerry, come on. Well, How's just, data going to solve all this so we can track ourselves? On, uh, on what Phil sort of uh, suggested. I, I mentioned at dinner, if, uh, if you're, uh, a book I would highly recommend is called The Book of Why. And where we are in, in artificial intelligence today is, is a lot of correlation. Uh, but we are going to get to causation. And we're, we're going to be able to say, if I take this, X will happen. And we are going to be able to, at some point, uh, at an individual level, not only be able to know their carbon footprint, but we're going to be able to know that that carbon footprint is affecting this particular species. That may be 20 years from now. But we're getting there. We're also going to be able, and I think what, what, what Secretary Paulson is saying is spot on. We've got to, I, I totally agree, industry is not, going to, is not the solution here. But I do think citizens are the solution here. And I do yeah, think that I cities have an opportunity uh, to help citizens understand, and this is, I'm connecting the dots here, understand that their choices affect our political leadership, they affect our policies, and they collectively uh, can help us, and we need to start seeing the correlation and the causation, not only of the decisions we make politically, but the decisions we make in terms of our purchases, uh, the, the decisions we make in terms of where we send our kids to school, uh, uh, all of these things. We're going we're gonna to live in a world one day where we're going to see the effects of our decisions, and we're going to make better decisions as a result. So I'm optimistic, uh, but it's going uh, to take a lot more innovation. It's not, it's not going to happen overnight and it may be 20 years from now. 
but you know we may not have 20 years. That's a good point. And, that, and that's a problem. I think I think we are in a race against time, and how to help people understand the urgency, to give them the knowledge, and understand because you know yeah, I, I I had the uh, the you know the dubious pleasure of being Treasury Secretary during a financial crisis. But when there's a financial crisis, at least at the end, the government can come in. It, it took an immediate crisis, can come in and, and do things to prevent a, a, a disaster. Uh, climate change is, is much more insidious because it's cumulative, it's, it's slow moving, and, and the longer we wait, the fewer options we have. And actually, when you look at what's happening with a species, I, I, I think uh, you know a, a big part of it is climate change. A very, very big part of it is climate change, and, and another very big part of it is is is, is, is human human activity. I mean, what gives me hope, hopeful, is that you know, I see a huge difference in the level of awareness. Uh, in a positive way in developing countries uh, than I do actually here in America. And I've only been back for a year and haven't lived here quite some time, so maybe it's more profoundly noticeable to me. Um, but in, uh, in, in, in Kenya, where I was living before, uh, people know about the Sustainable Development Goals. They know about the climate agreement, and the reason they know about it is because it is very, really, is very real for them and it's very felt for them because it affects their livelihoods. They need to see that the short rains are shorter or they're not coming at all. The long rains are not you know, uh, coming in the right time. Uh, this affects agriculture and, and harvest, which affects uh, how people and why people are moving into cities. It affects biodiversity. It creates conflict of land between species and, and people. Uh, there's, you know, it, it creates migration and, 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 and conflict between people and people. So these big issues and the impacts you know, of, of climate and the importance of having a sustainability are really understood quite well, even by kids uh, in, in developing countries. And I've seen that across the world, much more so than here. So I agree that a big awareness and advocacy um, you know, campaign you know, is, is needed here, but you have a lot of things that are really just you know, unfortunately locked in. And so the more that we can do to support you know, the continued awareness globally and in places like China where Secretary Paulson has been talking about and where the greatest growth is happening now, I think will be very, very important and, and key to ensuring that in, in 20 years, we're not just you know, in really emergency mode. Yeah. Well, you'd think with something to do with the floods that are happening that uh, right now across the nation yeah, that there will be more awareness. So I, I'm just going to wrap up, and I think, Phil, since you created the exhibit and we've uh, been partners in this, so what do you see as what's next? Oh, okay. Uh, or what do you, you had some closing remarks, I know. I, uh, I, the exhibit was, was really a great idea to try to get a global perspective very quickly on, on the sort of urban dynamics and our urban future. Uh, and then uh, Lynn and, and uh, Michael Wood uh, asked six local design firms to contribute in different subjects, from ecology to livability to materiality. I, I, I do think that, that cities are, it's a very positive time for cities and, and, and it's accessible, making cities greener. Uh, this is critical, but I think there's tremendous momentum at this time. There's a wonderful quote I love by uh, this Robert Brown, who's a former senator uh, in Australia, and he says, if our future isn't green, uh, it isn't at all. And, and not to keep coming back to the environment, but I, I do think we've got to prioritize that equally with everything else. Uh, and that's where I just see tremendous challenges. So I think uh, there's a lot of momentum now. I, I think uh, Chicago is a great city for discussing city building. We have a lot of opportunities here to attract population back, build, build the population of the city, and uh, lower the carbon footprint of the city at the same time. So I, 
Okay. Right. Secretary I, Carlson. I, believe it. I just want to say that Phil, as far as I'm concerned, is a global resource. When I look at the difference he's made in China uh, to, to their urbanization, and in, in China, what, what they do is they, they're growing so fast, you, you test different concepts. And, and they test it on a big scale. And so some of the things that Phil has done there, I, I think has just been extraordinary. And, uh, and so that, that's an example. There, there is an example of how you know, you, you, some, you know, a, an advanced uh, economy like, like the US can make a difference around the world. So I, I apologize Thank for you. leaving, but it's been a pleasure to be, be on this. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I think, Sam, Carrie, you had one question, then yeah. we'll open it up to questions. Sure, I just wanted to add one thing. You know, when we talk about designing the future city, we have nations that have committed to um, how can they make their nation better with artificial intelligence. I would ask many of you as city planners, a plan for artificial intelligence in terms of how we make our cities safer, how we make our education system better, how we make housing uh, more affordable, um, should be in our, uh, our city planning. There should be a plan to build better products, services. Uh, there should be a plan of how to transform the city uh, with the, uh, you know, that should be an aspect of city planning. You wouldn't think of building a building without electrical outlets. Why would you think of planning a city without the most important general purpose technology of our lifetimes? That is a great closing about the future city. <laughs> so uh, we're open to questions now, and uh, we have a microphone, Hallie, and our first question is up here. Thank you. Uh, Mike Davidson with the Chicago Community Trust. Um, fascinating conversation, so thank you. Um, and I think I'm going to ask a functioning democracy question to underscore a point that Secretary Paulson made. Um, we've heard a lot about, in the panel discussion today, a lot about institutions, a lot about systems, um, a lot about organizations. Um, and I think, Patricia, you started to go here, and Carrie, you started to go here. But I didn't hear a lot about how we actually engage people. And certainly in the West, and I can speak for, as an American, there's a lot of trust issues between people and institutions, government institutions, the private sector, et cetera. So, Systems and institutions are made up of people. Sectors are made up of people. And if we want people to engage in, in designing their future city, how do we do that? Where are you seeing some terrific models across the world? And you know, China, sadly, is not a great example. So I feel like it's often an apples and oranges comparison when we hold China up as, a, as an exemplar of, of green cities. Um, they just have the luxury of being able to do that by virtue of being a national government. So anyhow, what, what are you seeing around the globe to engage people in the future of their cities, particularly with the, 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 the economic and social inequities that we experience, certainly in the city and country? Patricia? Yeah, thank you. So that's a fantastic question. Thank you very much. So from the UN perspective, there is something launched uh, just before the uh, Paris Climate uh, Agreement, and it's called the Local 2030 Initiative. And this is basically about democratizing the SDGs and making them a reality for people and communities. And so how that's being operationalized or realized on the ground are through uh, what they call local 2030 hubs. And anyone can set up a local 2030 hub. You can set up a local 2030 hub. A business can set up a local 2030 hub. A city can set up a local 2030 hub. The point of it is to get that sort of that engagement on the ground and that ownership of this big sort of global agenda here and actually make it a reality. And so it can be anything from a smaller, you know, sale community project to an individual commitment to help to, you know, foster uh, uh, awareness on the use of plastic, you know, to, to much larger uh, issues around climate change and inequality. Uh, and, and, and uh, the point is to actually make it real for, for people. So that's the one example and that we're very actively engaged in as many of my colleagues in the UN and uh, I would encourage you to go on local 2030 uh, UN website and you can find more information. I would just add, I, um, it's a great question, not my lane of focus, uh, but if you think about the healthcare field for a moment, uh, many people would, would properly assert that we have a sick care system, right? Uh, most Americans engage when they're ill versus engage uh, from day one. 
And when we look at the models where people are engaged on day one, it is a community-based model. It is a social-based model. It is people-centric. And so whether it's gaming, whether it's bingo, when I say gaming, I mean electronic gaming, but I do think that therein lies um, a possible path forward, is that we find ways to uh, make people engage in their health. We find ways to make people engage in their city. Uh, and I think that that's something that, uh, as a society, we haven't done as much that we need to do more of. Uh, and, and we really need to, to, to start at a very young age. Uh, so I do think, I know that you know, Arnie uh, Duncan and I talked about this a lot, the, the vast number of schools that we have in, the, in all the cities that go unused uh, half the time because they close at the end of the day, but yet you have this, uh, this uh, tremendous uh, uh, property that could be used for the public good. It's just a small example, but that's, that's where my head is, is that let's get people more involved. Other questions? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Beth Herbert. I work for Leap Innovations. We're a nonprofit here in Chicago that helps to connect education and innovation to improve outcomes for kids. And Carrie, I appreciate you bringing education into the conversation here. And I was wondering if you could talk more about how AI or ambient computing, which I don't know much about, or data um, could be leveraged as part of a smart city to, um, to really improve outcomes for kids and create pathways maybe in and out of school to help learning? It's a great question. You know, I'm, I'm reminded, uh, one of my friends who lives here in Chicago, the, uh, the sister of Arnie Duncan, Sarah Duncan. So Sarah went to Harvard, and, uh, and she said something to me that was pri still sticks in my head, which was that her most profound transformative educational experience was from her mother in the Children's Center and not from Harvard. She felt Harvard is a great institution, takes really great kids, and outputs really great kids. Uh, so I, I, I think about uh, what Sue does, and that doesn't scale. So how do we make something like that scale? And I think that uh, Khan Academy scales, but it, it misses a little bit of the human connection because, so I think, they're, they're, I think where AI and ambient computing uh, plays a role, uh, let's take an example. So uh, maybe I'm 10 years old, I'm walking around my home, and um, just as you know, my Fitbit or my Apple Watch tells me, hey, get up and walk, maybe something else in my home in an engaging, amusing, fun way says, hey, uh, would you like to do this quiz today? Would you like to learn Spanish today? But I think that we can get there. We can get to, um, uh, with small cost technology, start, and that's where Ambient plays a role, get this embedded into homes where it starts engaging. So just as a television today, even though we don't see this, uh, we see this with, uh, uh, with, with our devices. They know who we are. They know what our uh, uh, programming preferences are. Uh, but we can do that with technology. We can, uh, it can detect who we are. It can uh, detect that, uh, that our walking has changed over time, and maybe that's a sign of an illness. Uh, we can breathe into things and detect 17 illnesses. But from an education standpoint, I do think we can do more uh, engaging um, uh, with, with, uh, with individuals. I hope that made sense. Uh, yeah. But that's where I, I, I would love to see the future. I think you're scaring a little bit sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Michael. Uh, so I'm Michael Krauss. I'm with a consulting firm in town. I just saw Dan Doktoroff present Sidewalk Labs and Google's efforts up in Toronto. And I was kind of blown away by what they're trying to do in building the city of the future in Toronto. Any ideas about how we can motivate that kind of activity here in Chicago, tactically, what, what are your guide, guidance? Who wants to try? Do you want to try that one? Sure. I, I agree. I think what they're trying to do there and... Do you want to explain what it is for people who might not know? Do you... Well, you explain it. You're far more qualified. Oh. Well, but I haven't seen their presentations. But they have a, a piece of waterfront land in Toronto that they are uh, planning the sort of next generation uh, urban district or neighborhood, but they're rethinking traditional uh, urban infrastructure systems, they're rethinking the public street, uh, how you use the public street, how it can vary uh, from the morning where you've got commute time to uh, the afternoon where there isn't much commute time so you can use it for other things. So lots of flexibility in, in uh, the urban infrastructure. I don't know too much about 
the actual building types if they're trying to innovate in housing and workplace. Timber-based construction that will give jobs yeah. from the timber industry and be more energy efficient. Yeah. So what's, I, I think what's great about a, uh, projects like this is it brings it all together, the design of urban infrastructure, the design of buildings, an exploration of smarter, less embodied energy materials. You're kind of bringing all this together. And they're determined to sort of break new ground. So I, I think everybody's watching this project, but I think I've also read where they've kind of been spearheading this without bringing the community along. So they've got some of the same problems, Mike, you were just mentioning. Uh, and that is a problem when you look at uh, project, big projects like Lincoln Yards or 78 or uh, some of these other heavy lift projects in Chicago. Uh, there is a need to develop an approach uh, and start to push that forward. There's also a need to bring communities together to help author this, uh, to get the right uh, relationship between this new addition to the city and the existing neighborhoods. Uh, so it's very, I think it's a very challenging problem to be innovative uh, and at the same time uh, uh, really grassroots in, in sort of collective authorship. Well, and I'm going to get Carrie involved in here because I'm familiar with the project being from Toronto. And uh, one of the questions is who owns the data? Yes. And okay. how, how long is the data going to be kept? And how's the data used? And I think that's almost a bit of a generational thing, too, yes. that we're more concerned about it than perhaps future generations. But this whole data, which can make us such a better city, is really you know, the crux of their issue. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that cities should own their own data. Uh, they should own this data, uh, but citizens uh, should, own their, should own their data too. And citizens should have a right to say uh, how that data can be used. And I think, you know, foremost is transparency. Uh, if you're going to own data, you should, if you're gonna, if you're gonna, if a citizen's engaging with you, you're collecting data from them and you're gonna own it, you need to be transparent in terms of your usage of that. And the citizen needs to be, I think citizens should buy into that usage. Uh, in some cases, we know in the healthcare field that, um, that citizens will say, yeah, you can, uh, you can have my genomics data for free if you give me this in, 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 you know, uh, in exchange. So I think uh, transparency around the uh, usage is, is paramount, but I do think cities should, should own data. Yeah, I wanted to add one other uh project that was similar to this, trying to be innovated at multiple levels, uh, that we were lucky enough to collaborate on with Oak Ridge National Lab a few years ago, three years ago, where they were experimenting with additive manufacturing and polymers in 3D printing buildings. They were also looking at uh, car engines that could uh, produce electricity and power wirelessly batteries within a house. So you could pull your house off the grid and create these microgrids. And uh, we were able to pull all of that together into a project and 3D print uh, a building and 3D print a car and then have a, uh, an efficient engine that they described as <laughs> like the, the engine of your refrigerator that's on 24 hours a day, and it might be running your car, but when you're not using your car, it's plugged in and it's running the building. And uh, so they created the engine, printed the car, we designed the building, printed the building, all beginning to end a nine-month effort. Uh, and. Uh, it was, to me, a great example of exploring new generation materials that don't create waste, because we still have this tremendous waste issue with building, uh, exploring uh, building technologies that didn't exist four or five years ago, uh, and then getting buildings off the grid, which the more you find out about the urban power grid network, you're shocked at the inefficiencies of that. And I think that these kinds of problems uh, of bringing multiple disciplines together, and I think uh, uh, the Google project in Toronto is, is one of these, uh, it helps to shift the needle on many different levels. And I think we need a lot more experiments like this. Hi, I'm Rob Stein from the Shedd Aquarium. And 
I have a background as a technologist, so I really appreciate the discussions we had about how data analysis and artificial intelligence could bring benefits, but I'm curious about the, the extractive and environmental costs of reliance on a technology solution to future city problems. So there's been a lot of creative discussion, but I, I don't really hear us addressing those uh, environmental impacts of the technology usage that we're relying on. Mm -hmm. Who wants to go on that one? So when you, when you think about the, uh, the negative impacts, is it uh, from an energy and green, is that the? Energy usage, extractive costs of the technology that we're running. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I don't know if I have the best answer, but uh, I think cities have an opportunity, obviously, to use cloud computing, which um, has an opportunity to, uh, to reduce the, uh, the negative environmental impacts because um, uh, you know, increasingly, Google and uh, Google's cloud platform, as an example, is moving toward a uh, green, sustainable uh, energy. So I think there's an opportunity there to to not build uh, compute centers, not to build um, you know these large uh, energy centers, but instead to use public clouds. I think the cities are are best able and, and a best fit for that. Uh, Lisa, there's a microphone coming up. Lisa McClung, um, former trustee and avid uh, supporter of the Architecture Foundation. I'm curious, we've talked a lot about the, the what and the why and the how, but I'm curious about the who. So having been part of the Aspen Institute cohort on life and work in the digital age, one of the things we discovered was the lack of skilling of people to understand how to take advantage of everything we've talked about. And if we look in the brain power in the room, it's extraordinary. But if you think about the capabilities and the skill bases of our government people every day that are working on everything from codes to building reviews to planning, what do you see as some of the either major initiatives that are out there to upskill and train and keep current the people that do this day to day or some of the opportunities to do that? Because I think the who is probably the, the operating mechanism. I'm just curious what your perspectives are on that. Yeah. Patricia? So I can give you a global example, um, which maybe is happening here in the States. Uh, so we're doing a project in Nairobi uh, right now with, the, um, with a group of businesses within the Global Compact Local Network. Um, but it was really inspired by, um, actually I do, have, I do have a US example in Pittsburgh, so I'll come to that. But in Nairobi, it was, it was inspired by the Kenyan Association of Manufacturers. And so at the national level, uh, the government has a green growth strategy, and it's identified a few key sectors uh, within that green growth economy that it wants to really drive uh, growth, and quite aggressively, 10% uh, per annum over the next uh, 10 years, and create jobs, you know, address poverty, um, and do so in, in an equal, uh, equitable way. Um, but the issue is exactly what you're uh, saying, and there's a skills gap. So you have a lot of young people, even those that are, have access to or going to technical colleges or university in the technical <coughs> colleges, still coming out of those, um, those training places and not being skilled up enough to take on these jobs in these new sectors of the economy. So the Kenyan Association of Manufacturers started its own sort of program to address this. Um, and because if you want to have an investment coming in, you need a local labor market. And um, so we are supporting, you know, based on that initiative, um, how, how we're going to do that sort of at a, you know, scale that up, uh, first in Nairobi, but then globally. And then recently I was with the, the city of Pittsburgh that was describing to me a program that Siemens is doing. Um, similarly, uh, they're, think they're, they're thinking about expanding, you know, their operations there, and no company wants to be alone, right? I mean, it doesn't make for a good uh, sort of working environment, um, it doesn't attract talent. And so Siemens is doing a whole sort of training program around uh, different components of the smart cities industry. But interestingly, not for those employees that would necessarily work for Siemens. They could work for any company that's there. They could work for the, for the local government. The whole point is to try to drive a competitive market. So you are seeing pockets of that that are addressing the who, but a lot more needs to be, to be done. I, I completely agree. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mary Sue, and then uh, I, that's our last question. Thank you for this terrific panel, and I'm inspired by a lot of the global examples. Um, Mary Sue Barrett with the Metropolitan Planning Council. I heard Hank Paulson talk about how we have 
veered away from the value of planning. And I heard Phil Enquist talk about how we have assets that we're not deploying together, such as vacant land, which we often don't understand as, as an asset here in Chicago. For example, um, that affordable housing, housing, housing alone can't turn around an area. So to bring it really topically, uh, this morning, the Senate, um, Illinois uh, Senate is debating a transportation bill. We've got a new governor putting together a cabinet thinking about how to deploy technology and how to make investments smart. We've got a new mayor coming into office in less than two weeks thinking about some of the same things. So how do we inject uh, the thinking that gets out of the silos that we're so infamous for um, to, to bring in the best ideas from across the globe and the power of technology to get our governmental structures um, thinking about putting the pieces together better. I'm sorry, Secretary Paulson isn't here to <laughs> <laughs> have a lot of strong ideas about that, but who wants to go for that? Well, I'll, I'll start. I, I'm glad you brought up the silo phenomenon. I, I think that it also relates to your question, too. I think the way we think and act in silos is really preventing uh, innovative solutions and also contributing to why and how we leave so many people behind. And uh, I, I just think that the more we can bring uh, various disciplines, academic institutions, uh, government agencies, communities together to have a much broader platform of discussion and exploration, uh, the better. I, we, I mentioned this last night at Arizona State University in Tempe, they're working so hard to, to step out of their traditional university silo and connect cities that have uh, similar problems across the United States uh, related to water and energy. And now they're collaborating uh, uh, with Phoenix, Tucson, Los Angeles on uh, urban sprawl and development patterns. Uh, and I, I think this is an example of a university stepping out of their comfort zone and engaging many in a broader discussion to achieve some kind of regional brilliance, which we're not very good at. Uh, so I just, I think we need more thinking like that. And I think a new mayor coming will motivate this city, I think, in ways to sort of bring people together. Any other comments? Well, I love this, this question because it's, it's exactly right that you need to sort of think you know, globally uh, even when, when you're looking at your, you know, the, the, the solutions to local uh, challenges and opportunities that you're facing. So I would say you know, this, this center, uh, and we were talking yeah. about this you know, at dinner last night, and given that you have a network of over 150, <laughs> is it, uh, other centers that you're working with around the globe, uh, can really take on that, that sort of leadership uh, role. And I'll give you an example where New York City is also trying to do this now, where they have some opportunity zones within the city and thinking about how they you know, hold these sort of SDG, uh, sustainable development goal challenges, and how different business and academia and actors, uh, professionals, practitioners, uh, students can come together and sort of experiment and how that can you know, help to transition New York City uh, into a, a sort of a, a more livable, uh, Inex inexpensive uh, city um, <laughs> with better infrastructure, transport, uh, et cetera. So I see, you know, there, there's my, my view of just being here, you know, for the short time and, and speaking to Lynn and the colleagues, there's a real opportunity for, um, for I think, the center to do something similar here. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for coming this morning. This is the uh, first of a series, and we'll be doing uh, two of these per year where we talk about what's next. And I think we all learned this morning that uh, there's a lot we don't know, but there's a lot that we can discuss to educate ourselves and plan for the future. Uh, we uh, will continue this dialogue. As you notice, we've got a number of cameras in the back of the room. We are filming this. We'll have video clips. We also uh, have done something unique in, we have a terrific local uh, artist, uh, Creighton Berman. Creighton, do you want to put up your hand? And he's actually being diligently uh, translating what we have here today into pictures. And so we'll be, yes. <laughs> 
I'm not sure that gives me a lot of confidence on this piece of paper back there, but anyway. Um, and he's going to be pushing this out to, uh, to you so you'll have something that you can not, not only look at yourself and what were the big takeaways, but also push out to your friends because we really do want this to be a dialogue that we're uh, not just talking to the people here in this room, but there's a, a larger opportunity, and especially as we talk about the changes coming up with the, we have a new governor, we have a new mayor, it's a chance to, uh, to really have a collective conversation. Uh, I'd have to thank Sandy Hilton and Norm Edelson for their uh, wonderful support of this and making this happen. And I want to remind you all that the center's open, and if you haven't been to, to the Architecture Center, I know Christy has, she was there on the first day, thank you very much. But, um, you know, wander through, see the exhibit, um, whether it be skyscrapers or go in to see the city model and uh, the very dynamic uh, projection mapping that we have on that translates some of big data for the city. But thank you very much for coming this morning, and uh, please pass the word on about what's next.